first just about that. This is one in a series of webinars that we've been offering in partnership with the Fire Science Exchange Network, and it's looking at Land Fires Biophys Biophysical Settings Review project, this one specifically. The schedule for all the webinars, and we have uh, I think about 10, um, about halfway through, is posted on the Nature Conservancy's Conservation Gateway Land Fire site. And that URL will be available at the end of this presentation or any time that you want to shoot me a line, I'll be glad to get you there. All the webinars are recorded and posted on Land Fire's YouTube channel, and I know that North Atlantic Fire Science has an uh, opportunity to post as well. So you'll be able to get a recording about a week after this presentation. We publicize the webinars via the Land Fire Bulletin, among other places. So if you don't subscribe yet, please do that. And the link to subscribe is also on the last so slide of this presentation. I've put a little note in the chat box, the lower left corner. If you're having trouble seeing this, I have a PDF of it, and I can send it to you directly as an attachment to email. So if you have any technical difficulties, write your address in the chat box, and I'll be sure you can follow along with our PDF. Today's presenter is Randy Swatty. He's an ecologist on TNC's Land Fire team. He joined the TNC's Michigan chapter in 2002 and the Land Fire program in 2007. Randy has worked with federal partners and owners of large landscapes to promote sustainable management and was the Great Lakes Land Fire modeling lead. He's currently living in Evanston, Illinois, but he's a youper at heart. And he's one of the ecologists leading the Biophysical Settings Review and Update Project. He's covering the Land Fire BPS review today. He will tell you what it is, how it works, why it's important, and that's our introduction. Randy, take it away. All right, thanks, Jeannie, and thanks to everyone for joining in today. It's, it's honestly kind of a humbling experience because I know that there is so much good work in the North Atlantic. I know there's been tons of research, and um, I like to think of Land Fire as a way to sort of compile the work that you guys do and the work that's been done before you. So I hope that we can integrate more knowledge into Land Fire to make it better, make it more useful for you guys. And so I really, really appreciate this opportunity. So while you're looking at the, the agenda, I want to tell you about my first job with the Nature Conservancy. I was employed, sort of, by Mead West Vaco through the Nature Conservancy um, to help them do landscape scale assessments and to help them do work across ownerships. And coming out of a soil fungi background, I naively thought that um, all that data was out there. I thought that all the forests had been described, you know, all the natural disturbance regimes were very well understood, and I thought there'd be one data set that I could use to go assess large landscapes. That was definitely not the case. Um, while while many, most of the agency lands had inventories, uh, the large industrial landscape owners had inventories, those data sets wouldn't talk to each other or there were antitrust laws. And we obviously definitively did not have data for the non-industrial private forest landowners. So um, when I heard about this thing called land fire, this weirdly named thing that was going to create uh, data sets of vegetation across all lands, all ownerships, um, I was really excited. I was pumped. And, and you'll, I hope you'll hear it today. I'm still 10 years later, very excited about land fire. I know that it's not perfect. We have room for improvement, um, but I still think it's, it's one of the best. Um, I, I hate this analogy, but toolbox is out there. So um, today I'll be going through what you see on the screen here, and as Xander noted um, in, the in the chat box, I'll try to watch that. So if you have questions, especially if I'm confusing or you have some technical difficulty, let us know, and I'll try to address that as we go. So thank you, and we're going to launch into this. So um, here's some sort of official looking verbiage that describes land fire. And, um, it's sort of official looking, but there are some really great words in there. One is comprehensive. So Landfire delivers historic data sets, current data sets. Um, it's all built on vegetation. 
even though we're called land fire, um, it's about the vegetation. We, we build fire and fuel data sets off of those vegetation sort of foundational data sets. And you'll learn more about that today. But, um, you know, I think the name land fire was probably conjured up over a beer or something, and it's okay. But I know I get pegged as a fire person. And while I'd love to, while I'd love to get my red card and work with you guys on a prescribed fire, it's not just about fire, and I'm, I'm not a fire person as much as I respect what you guys all do. So please remember that. And another thing I want to say here is um, acknowledge, again, all the great work um, that you guys have done and others in the North Atlantic and across the country. Um, there's no way I can cite or acknowledge all that great work today, but I wanted to acknowledge that. So what do we use this thing called land fire for? Um, Illinois, Wisconsin, Michigan, Colorado, <laughs> and probably some other states have done statewide fire needs assessments. They use a lot of different data sets. They obviously use some of their own data sets, but oftentimes when it comes to looking across the region to put their state in context or to look across um, all the different ownerships, they look to land fire to fill in data gaps. So um, it's used for prescribed fire. Also, I know this is um, the, the fire science exchange, but um, you would think that I wrote principle six of the Forest Stewardship Council certification. Principle six is all about looking at the large landscape. It's all about comparing current to historic vegetation conditions, and land fire really sets the stage for that. Um, it's, it's really pretty phenomenal how that particular principle lines up with land fire. Also, um, there are hundreds of papers on Google, Google Scholar now that have used land fire data, and they use it for wildlife habitat modeling. They use it for to jump start carbon, fire, wildlife, and climate modeling. And also in the Northeast, one of my, my favorite uses that I was just reminded of today was um, a group developed an Appalachian Trail decision to support system, which obviously goes from Maine far south. And they use land fires, the existing vegetation type, the existing vegetation cover, and height data sets as part of their tool. So that's a really fun recreational sort of use of land fire data. Also, another favorite story of mine um, comes from the Cherokee National Forest. They had sort of a typical problem, unfortunately. They had um, several ecological issues on their forest, and they had vocal stakeholders who did not agree on what to do. They didn't agree on whether they needed more fire, less fire, more thinning, less thinning. Um, so they brought in a talented facilitator named Greg Lowe, who used to be with the Nature Conservancy, who basically modeled out their positions and their thoughts. Taking the land fire models, then incorporating their ideas and running them into the future. And so it was a great sort of collaborative learning exercise. And they were successful. They came up with a set of recommendations um, as a stakeholder group, an amazing achievement. Who would guess that geeks with models and pixels and data sets could bring people together? But it's happened in several places across the country. So here's Here's the best way to probably drill into land fire uses. Go to the WAM, which we think must be one of the best acronyms out there, our web hosted applications map with an exclamation point. If you don't put the exclamation point, you'll get the band named WAM. Or you can go to the website below. And all these websites, I know it's kind of hard to write them down as we're, as we're going through the slides, so we'll be sending these out um, via Amanda to you for easy access later. But each one of these dots represents um, a, a, a land fire use. Most of these are non-fire, and they're just ones that we come across that we think are especially, especially cool, illustrative, and, and are based in land fire data. So with that, you can check out applications of land fire across the country. All right, so, <laughs> excuse me, I'm gonna, talk about these five bullets here, then we're going to launch into the top two especially. So I want you to think about land fire in terms of aspatial models. That'll be a big focus of our conversation today. And then 
separate that out from the spatial data sets that you're probably far more aware of. Also, LAND fires is, is a fairly complete package. We have a fair amount of documentation. We have tools that plug into ArcMap. I also like to think of LAND fires as a way of thinking, and this may be the only place in the world where you have such an integrated and comprehensive set of, of data and tools for managers. And also, LAND fires is very alive. It's very vibrant. Um, I know that it's easy to think of a government organization as being a huge ship that, that's just kind of plodding across the ocean. But if you follow the newsletter and the bulletins that Jeannie Patton sends out, you'll, you'll see that LAMFAR is constantly developing new tools, updating tools, updating data sets, trying to be responsive to users. So I think of it as a great community of users, hackers. And when I say hackers, I mean that in the best way, people who are being creative with the data sets and contributors. So the Nature Conservancy had a cooperative agreement to describe and model reference conditions for the ecosystems of the United States. So basically what we did was we tried to put together what I think of as the country's first encyclopedia of natural ecosystems. And I know that there have been tons of work on ecosystem descriptions across the country, but working with NatureServe and hundreds of experts, to me it's the first sort of encyclopedia of ecosystems that um, is comprehensive and was consistently developed across the country. So we ran hundreds, excuse me, we ran dozens of workshops with hundreds of experts who described these natural ecosystems, then modeled the disturbances to get an estimate of how, how each how much of each developmental stage or succession class will be on the landscape. The descriptions and models were reviewed by other experts, then we did a QAQC process and are available to you here at this link that we'll send you later. So as I mentioned, these reference condition models and descriptions, you know, we tried to describe how the ecosystems looked and worked prior to European settlement. We broke each ecosystem or biophysical setting into five or fewer succession classes. Each one of the succession classes is defined by species, percent cover, and height. So I got to note a couple of things as well. These biophysical settings were um, try, to, try to get at reference conditions, but we're not looking at climate change and we are not necessarily saying that, that reference conditions are the same as desired future conditions. It may look like we're giving out a prescription of what a forest or a grassland should look like. We're, we're not trying to do that. We're, we're presenting context and background and information for people that can then use their values, their objectives to make their decisions on the landscape. So we wanted to understand historic disturbance patterns, get those proportions of succession classes, get return intervals for the disturbances. Um, these models are connected to several spatial data sets, and we want to engage with experts like you all. So the models look like this. <coughs> Using vegetation dynamics development tool, which has then since been replaced by software called STSIM, for short for state and transition simulator. We entered in the parameters of the succession classes up to five, the disturbance regimes and their impacts. So these are models that quantify rates and pathways for succession and the probability of disturbance under pre-settlement reference conditions or disturbance regimes. These models, which come in a database and work in STSIM are accompanied by a description document that describes the site characteristics as in climate, soil, surficial geology that would guide the mapping of each biophysical setting and also um, sort of the, the references and the other information to back up these models. So here's another way to look at this model and I love how 
I, I have a little typo at the top that it makes it imply that Dr. Greg Nowacki built the North Central Interior Dry Music Oak Forest and Woodland. He didn't build the dry music Oak Forest and Woodland. He built the dry music and Oak Forest um, model. So yeah, I thought that was kind of funny. He would probably get a kick out of that. Um, anyways, working with Greg, he first defined those succession classes represented by the boxes. And Greg did a really great job for us in that he, he you know, kind of gave a name to those succession classes. Prairie, Savannah, Woodland, Oak Forest, and Mesophytic Forest. Those of you that know Greg know that this is how he works and thinks. So he gave him a name, then he, he defined how long or the duration of the succession class. Then in that document, that description that I mentioned, he put in the species, the canopy height, and the canopy cover for each succession class. So as you might imagine, the prairie succession class is defined by its herbaceous cover. The mesophytic forest, on the other hand, is closed canopy, tall trees, um, beech, maple, when you don't have enough fire to keep those trees out. Greg then put in the succession pathways. So this is probably very familiar to you. Um, if prairie doesn't burn enough, it succeeds to savannah. Savannah doesn't burn enough or isn't blown over or have some other disturbance, it succeeds to woodland and so on. So we put in those succession classes, then the succession pathways, then the real fun begins. Um, here's where we put in the disturbances and for the cleanliness of the slide, I did not enter in all the disturbances, which again could be fire, wind, um, for the oak savanna, you wouldn't have flooding, um, but all natural disturbances were inputted into the biophysical settings models. Then we gave each disturbance an annual probability. And I put in an example of this below the savanna box. So Greg modeled that the savanna would have um, surface fire with an annual probability of 0.1. Most of us are used to thinking in years, for fire return intervals, and so this would be every 10 years or less, there would be some sort of surface fire keeping that savanna open. The prairie had much more fire, much more frequent surface fire. And again, this, the red lines indicate some of the disturbances, they're not all in here, and um, this is how we built the models. We put all this information into the modeling software. We hit go because we wanted to see how much of these succession classes would have been on the landscape. So you see in this model for the North Central, so this is more my neck of the woods in the central United States, 19% of the landscape under natural disturbance regimes would have been in this woodland. Very little of the landscape would have been in the mesophytic forest because of all the fire going through this oak forest and woodland. Another thing to note is that there are other oak models, right? So there's an oak model and description, biophysical saying that has even more fire that would have less of the oak forest. So to understand the models, you have to look at the, the descriptions, you have to go back and forth. Um, so it's very important that you keep that in mind when you're looking at the models or the descriptions. So the descriptions are Easy to get at landfire.gov. I'm gonna show you how to do that in a moment, but they look sort of like this. This is just a screen capture from the top of the model. And this is a good one. Um, Greg Nowacki, super credible, super experienced in, in the oak forest and woodlands. Um, reviewed by Dave Cleland, another super credible person, and Brendan Ward as well. And then I did the QAQC on the model. So to get these bundles of descriptions and the databases that run the models, you would go to landfire.gov, hit the vegetation button that I have circled at the top, then start clicking through. There are a few clicks to get to the download the BPS models um, link. And we'll send this to you as well. And 
I hope it's clear, but I am here to help. Our land fire team is here to help always with any questions regarding the land fire data sets or models. So I'm watching the chat box. I see no questions. Um, I'm going to summarize the models real quick and then encourage you to type any questions you have before I move on to the spatial data sets. And I'm, I think I've said all this. I'll let you look at that quick. Let me know if you have any questions. Okay, so on to the spatial data set. Okay, so Landfire Spatial Data is free, so graduate students love it. It covers all lands in the United States. It's updated every two years. And when I say it plays well with others, um, the GIS people on the phone might be shaking their heads. They might know better. Um, the Landfire data plays very well amongst the other Landfire data sets. It's designed to be integrated. But also with some crosswalking work, some effort, it is possible to um, complement your data with Landfire data or, con or, or vice versa. You know, um, we've had situations where people have great forest type information, but they don't have the height information. So we mash the data sets together. Also, Landfire data is delivered 30 meter pixels, a raster data set, and it's designed for large scale use. And this is where the scale lecture comes in. Um, typically what happens is I show a land fire map and people will go to where they had their first date or that stand where they've been managing their sugar bush for 40 years or something like that. They go to their backyard. And if a pixel is wrong on their favorite place, they say land fire data is junk. Um, land fire data is not meant for managing stands. It's not for small areas. The models and descriptions might give you some context for your stand, but the spatial data sets designed for use at larger scales. Um, I've drilled down with some people. Um, the Hiawatha National Forest and I have drilled down to fairly small areas, but we, we've done our homework. We know the strengths and weaknesses of the data. We know what we're dealing with. So, if you can imagine a graph where the level of effort in reviewing the data increases as the size of the area you're looking at decreases. So um, I'll be showing a good scale today as an example for you, but um, if you need to drill down further, give us a call and we can discuss scale issues. Landfire delivers, as I mentioned, um, some data sets that represent historic conditions, and I've got some of those boxed in here. As I did this, I, I feel like I need to rework this slide to make it a little clearer, but um, we deliver environmental site potential, which is sort of the same as potential natural vegetation groups or um, climax vegetation. The biophysical settings data set builds on the environmental site potential data by adding in disturbance. So if a site is more prone to wind throw or fire, then it would get a different biophysical setting because of that. Also linked to the biophysical settings are fire regime groups, mean fire return interval, and other fire data sets. Um, I've circled or boxed in some of the current data sets that I'll be talking about today. Um, all the fuel data sets are, are current or Current right now is 2012, and not too long we'll have 2014 data sets. So current is kind of in air quotes. Um, it takes us a while to, to put together all that data and to deliver it, so there's usually a lag time. So today I'm going to go into these questions a little bit, and um, to me it's sort of a teaser. I'm hoping that I um, inspire you to explore land for our data. I hope I make you think of ways you can help us improve the data sets and models. And I hope there's something enlightening here. Um, I'm not from the North Atlantic, so all your feedback will be greatly appreciated um, now or later. But I want to um, display what Landfire shows as the dominant biophysical settings or reference ecosystems of the North Atlantic. I'm going to explore which one, which biophysical settings were fire dependent, 
And then for fun, I dug into the models and, and did some work to graph out how many acres would have burned annually. And it's, it's really astronomical. And um, I'll tell you this now, and I'll say it again with the graph. No one has ever told me I've modeled too much fire. So it'll be interesting to get your feedback when we get to those graphs. <laughs> Questions for you, seriously. Um, we want to know what you agree with in my maps and the graphs and the concepts. What do you disagree with? We'll be curious to see if you had some new ideas of things you might do with land fire data or models. And I'm going to I'm going to prompt the la the answer to the last question. We've got some very specific ways you can help us, but we also um, just just appreciate ideas. Uh, we don't want to stifle creativity by telling you that you have to do this for land fire or you have to do that to help us improve it. We want we want it to be a broader conversation. So here they are. Here are the biophysical settings for the North Atlantic. What I did was I took the land fire mosaic grids or raster data sets for the whole country and I clipped it by the four, I think it's four, by the ecoregions that comprise the North Atlantic Fire Science Exchange. So that's, that's what those polygons are there. And for this area, we mapped 49 biophysical settings. And as you might imagine, 10 of them cover most of the area. And I've got those listed here. Uh, it, it was, in general terms, not too surprising to me. I knew you guys had a fair amount of the northern hardwoods for us. I knew that you had a fair amount of diversity. Um, and I knew that there are some oaks, especially farther south. And I'm going to also show you some of the other ecosystems which don't come up on this top 10 list. But that's, that's the map. And um, I did not put in a, a color legend. It would have been really messy. Uh, we're going to explore some specific biophysical settings in the next slides. And contact me if you want help downloading and using the data, and we can drill in and explore your landscape. So this is a basic map of what Landfire calls fire regime groups. So. I'm sorry the, the legend for the graph is a bit small at the bottom. I hope you can see that. But fire regime groups try to capture an element of frequency and an element of severity. So the green, which um, is pretty dominant up north, represents probably the northern hardwoods, places where um, fire is relatively rare and it could be of any severity. So severity is sort of lumped in that one. The orange fires are more of um, less than 35 year return interval, low and in mixed severity. So for example, all your pitch pine would be in that fire regime group. Also, you, you'll notice a little bit of red down south along the coast. Those are um, less than 35 year return intervals, replacement severity. That would be some of your coastal herbaceous biophysical settings. And I'd, be, I'd love to hear some feedback on that, um, I guess, that You'll have drying on the innermost part of those ecosystems, and you'll have fire that, that, um, that would rip through there. Here's another way land fire explores historic fire regimes. This is historic fire return interval, and it's the mean for the whole biophysical setting. So remember that a biophysical setting has multiple succession classes. Those succession classes have their own fire regime, if you will, and this is sort of an aggregate across the entire biophysical setting, then all those biophysical settings are mapped across the country, and then this is essentially an attribute of those biophysical settings. So again, you'll notice most of the fire is down south. There's a fair bit out on Cape Cod, Martha's Vineyard. I've had the great luck of visiting Nature Conservancy staff out there where they they would agree that that area should be red. There's a lot of pine and oak there. Um, so you'll see that we have a fairly, you know, fairly detailed list of mean fire return interval. And what I did to make it a little cleaner is I lumped. I present this partly just to remind you of how this can work. Um, and it makes things a little cleaner and, and may take care of, may make the data sets more meaningful for you. So this was an arbitrary lump based on what I thought was interesting. 
Um, you can do it however you want. I figured that everything less than 100 years I wanted to explore in more detail because I figured you've had fire suppression for 100 years. And um, I also wanted to tease out the red, which you can't see very well. I apologize on this map. Um, but I figured that would be the, the really frequent fire areas. And I should have made those a different color. But a lot of fire in your area. That's, that's the basic take home. Um, I, I know that our numbers may not be exact. Um, looking at some of the, the line here where you have, where you go from a lot of surface fire to less, that line may go up and down. Greg Nowacki and Melissa Van Gundy of the, of the Forest Service have um, their tension zone line, which is extremely useful. We're going to be looking at that to um, explore our pattern. But, you know, the bottom line to me is there was a lot of fire historically. Obviously, this is not including your current ag lands. It does not include your current urban. This is all historic before that. But lots of fire, um, presumably a lot of it Native American. Native American burning was um, considered a natural disturbance. So those, those, the, those fires were in our models. So um, another map was probably too much. This is the same map. And um, there, I wanted to show you just the names of some of these biophysical settings that have a lot of fire. Um, and I'll let you kind of explore those for a moment. And again, remember, this is the, the mean fire return interval across that biophysical setting. Know, kind of a composite of all the succession classes. This is historic, and this is all fires. So um, mostly surface again for most of these. But I, I hope what this does is, is kind of teases you a little bit and say, you know what, I'm not so sure about that northeastern interior dry music oak forest. I better, um, I better call Randy up, or I better ask him about the, the biophysical settings model review, because I think we can, we can refine that. So hopefully you're saying that, and hopefully you're saying, wow, this isn't too bad. I, I've always thought there was a lot of fire in, in the North Atlantic. So another thing we can do, which I think is really cool, is to run our modeling software, then export the data and make graphs with it. <laughs> and you can also make graphs within the modeling software. So what I did was I picked out the North Atlantic pitch pine forest which I've always heard has tons of fire. And I ran the model with reference or natural disturbance regimes for a thousand years. So you see the model kind of ramping up over time, then it starts to equilibrate as it runs. So this is not to say I'm modeling back to a certain point in time. This is taking natural disturbance regimes and running them for a thousand years. And what I came up with was that your North Atlantic pitch pine, which is the dark green on the map there historically, um, would have had 132,000 acres per year, or roughly 10% of the North Atlantic pitch pine would have had a fire of some sort. You'll see on the bottom the annual probabilities. And again, I should have converted those to um, fire return intervals and years, but that's this is what our model runs on, are the probabilities. So tons of fire for the North Atlantic pitch pine, as we all know. Um, maybe I don't have enough. That's what people usually tell me. You know, Randy, I think there would have been even more fire. So then we can drill in and compare those reference numbers to current numbers. All right, so this is looking at the remaining pitch pine habitat in the blue are the percentages, the reference percentages for the succession classes, which I have totally under-described on the bottom, but just to give you an idea of what these succession classes look like. Then we have current data for these succession classes. Graph this. And um, again, I don't judge based on those succession class descriptions at the bottom um, solely. But the take home for me here is that there's a lot more of the closed canopy 
non-pine succession class on the landscape today than there would have been historically. Uh, I called up one expert gentleman in the area and he said this, this matches what they see on the ground. Our exact numbers may not be right, but the pattern seems to match what I see actually across the country in our fire regime or our fire dependent ecosystems. You have fire suppression and you have some serious changes going on. Um, and typically in the east, it's filling in with red maples or other non-fire dependent species, which presents a huge challenge to you all. A challenge that, you know, we can help you with our data and make the case for more funding or help you set context. That's what we want to do because we know you've got a huge challenge out there. We also know that the, the oak fire, the oak biophysical settings would have had a fair amount of fire. Um, this particular northeast interior dry music oak forest would have had 850,000 acres a year of fire of some sort, or roughly 20%. So to me, you know, we've already got up to almost a million acres of fire historically, just looking at two biophysical settings. And the pitch pine is not even that widespread when you look across the whole North Atlantic. So then what we can do is split out the fire types. So um, we're able to run the model and then pull out all the disturbances if we wanted to. If I wanted to show you how often Greg Nowacki modeled wind or some sort of insects, we could have done that as well, but I wanted to focus on fire as an example of what we do. And you'll see that as expected in uh, oak forest of this type, almost all of it surface fire, more than half anyways. Um, and again, this is as would be expected. So. And here I'll take a moment to tell you what the different fires mean. So surface fire is when you have less than 25% top kill or canopy kill. Replacement fire is when you would have greater than 75% and mixed is in, in the middle. So um, same kind of graph as before. On the bottom are woefully inadequate succession class descriptions, just to give you an idea of what they look like. The blue bars represent the reference percentages for each one of those succession classes. You'll note that there's a big zero for uncharacteristic. The current condition is represented in red, and the basic pattern is that the, the oak forest is filling in with those more mesophytic You'll also notice that there's some uncharacteristic here. That comes from pixels that do not meet the reference condition in terms of structure, uh, in terms of canopy height, canopy cover, or type. So maybe, I don't know this, but maybe that uncharacteristic um, represents a situation where our mappers just you know, totally saw a signature for all red maple. I don't know what the situation is here with uncharacteristic. I would have to drill in to the existing vegetation type or height or cover data to see what that is. But um, sort of the question is, you know, is this our future? Is this where we're going? Does this match what people see on the ground? What are the implications for our resource values, for climate change? Um, and we can look at this for all of our ecosystems, whether they're fire dependent or not. The other thing I like to, to do with this slide is to say, um, as I mentioned, land fire is used for large areas. But what if you're a landowner and you have, you think you have some of that oak savanna and you're looking at this and you're saying across the North Atlantic, wow, there is an underrepresentation of that oak savanna. Man, I've got something special here. I am going to manage this oak savanna and keep it oak savanna because it is cool. It represents something that's rare across the North Atlantic. Um, so that this helps provide you context. If you have that mesophytic forest and you're thinking about doing some management there to convert it to oak, wow, probably a great idea. Though again, this is not a prescription. All right, so I wanted to make this into a pie chart. I did not get to that. So um, please understand that that bar on the far left is the cumulative value. 
also, these models are run by MapZone. So um, I did not do the work to match up these, all of the models with your fire science exchange area. So this is acres burned historically across these four map zones. All right, so um, almost 4 million acres of fire annually for map zone 60, 64, 65, 66. So granted, it, it is a large area, and there are large areas that would have had very little fire, or you have your northern hardwoods, for example, but there's, there was a lot of fire in the North Atlantic. So here's sort of the hope for all this. Um, I hope that the basic patterns fit your understanding. That is that there was a lot of fire in some of your ecosystems, tons of fire, and due to fire suppression and other management activities um, and other challenges such as invasive species, um, some biophysical settings are very different from today from what they were. Again, land fire does not say why there is this difference. You have to interpret the data and figure that out. But we can, land fire can help decide whether there's too much of the closed canopy succession classes, too little of the prairie or savanna. We can drill into that, but the mechanisms, um, you guys will always know best. I'm guessing that you saw something in these improvements. Um, you know, I like to think that land fire is this beautiful culmination, um, kind of catch box for all the research that's been done before. Obviously, we can't capture all the research. And obviously, people disagree. You know, some people may say these maps are brilliant. Some people are saying they're wrong. Um, we try our best to reconcile those differences. But please understand, we're working with people who disagree. We're working with um, time and budget constraints. But we want to hear your feedback. We want to make the data, the data better. And um, hopefully um, you saw some potential for use that maybe you hadn't thought of before. And you'll give us a buzz if you need help. Or, you know, the graduate students are incredible. I, I see graduate students all the time. They, they hear this thing called land fire, they Google it, and they're off to the races. And before you know it, they've got an analysis and a paper, and they've been super creative. They've used open source software to manipulate the data. It's just incredible what people are doing. So um, if you have some idea and need some help, let us know. So I've talked a lot about the biophysical settings, the models, and the descriptions. And I've sort of hopefully set the stage for you helping us make them better. So right now, um, we are working to review all those biophysical settings bundles, the descriptions, and the models. You can go to landfirereview.org if you just want to explore on your own and just send us comments that way. Um, mostly you can review Word documents that you can go to that website and download. Um, we're thinking 30 minutes to an hour, or you could spend days, depending on how deep you want to go. Um, Brad Simpkins and I and others are throwing around the idea of a little mini workshop to tackle some of the biggest issues um, in New Hampshire and North. Then my colleague Kim Hall and I are thinking about a little mini workshop in Pennsylvania to, to dig into the more southern areas. Um, we're interested in people who can review a single model. Maybe they have their favorite ecosystem or help us look at those broad patterns. Also, What's really important to keep our current data sets alive and looking good are if people submit plot data. So if you're doing a prescribed fire or you're doing a thinning or you're doing an invasive treatment, if you have information, geolocations of your plots, um, it helps us because we refresh our data sets every two years based on disturbances. So we need the plot data. The plot data also helps us train the satellite imagery. Basically, accuracy goes up with the number of plots. So um, it should be fairly easy. So a great question um, posted that I, I'm going to address in just a moment. It's a really good one. I don't know if you guys can all see it. I've got one more slide. I'm going to turn it over to Jeannie to talk about um, our communications 
Opportunities then, Tyler, yes, great question. So I'm gonna dig into that in just a moment. Yes, so these are ways that you can learn about Landfire. As I mentioned, we're gonna send these out to you. You don't have to write them all down, but if you're a Twitter person, we have a Twitter feed. If you like to watch videos, we have um, videos about applications. We have videos about how to manipulate the grids. Um, those are our most popular. We have bulletins and postcards that we send out electronically. We need you to opt in if you want one. Um, we can't just send them out to anyone. We need you to opt in. We have landfire.gov, and then we have our conservation gateway site. So um, with that, I'm gonna watch the chat box and there are some great questions. Um, Tyler asks, how are the historical conditions determined? Um, foundational question that I should have covered in, in detail. Um, so thanks for that, Tyler. Basically, our experts came with their own knowledge. They came with literature and whatever data sets they could supply. So the answer is, is highly variable. For example, some people came with a great knowledge of the general land office surveys and they would launch from there to, to help this determine historic conditions. Some people have done a lot of tree ring work and they have a good feel for the specific fire types, so they would come with that information to parameterize our models. Um, some people study wind throws, some people just study a, an ecosystem and come with all the disturbance information. So it's, it's highly variable, but it's based on expert knowledge, local data sets where we had them, and literature. And right now we're hoping to update the literature because we know there's some new science out there. Dr. Patterson asked, um, how do you differentiate between historic and prehistoric? What are the time frames? All right, so this is a, another great question. Um, and the first time I, I got a question like this was regarding beaver herbivory, right? So imagine you're in the Great Lakes where um, beaver populations have been managed like crazy going back hundreds of years from the, the pre-trapping, trapping, post-trapping post recovery, which era are you talking about? So our time frame is roughly just prior to major European contact. And I know that that's highly variable, um, especially in the Northeast. And so um, I, I can't give you an, an actual year, but that is the, the, the concept, the idea that we tried to capture. So we incorporated natural or disturbance regimes from Native Americans, but we're not talking thousands of years ago. We're talking a few hundreds of years ago. So. Um, when you're looking at the models, we, we, we appreciate feedback on that as well. So great, great question, Dr. Patterson. Great, thank uh, you, Randy. We'll, we'll give folks a, you know, a few moments to type some other questions into the chat box. Um, oh, there's another one, here we go. Okay. Just for a second here while Randy's doing the reading and getting his answer together. This is Jeannie again. And I'll draw your attention to the email address, landfire at tnc.org. If all of these URLs are screaming past you and you really don't want to write them down, if you have questions about our bulletins or postcards, you want to opt in, you need a video, uh, library, bibliography references, um, I'm the one who can help you. Send any of your questions to landfire at tnc.org if you don't want to go to these other URLs, and I will get uh, them sent to the right people who can help you, and uh, we just want to be able to get you what you need, landfire at tnc.org. Okay, a couple of great questions have come in. Um, first, regarding fire regimes in southern Wisconsin and, and the oak model that I showed. Um, this is something we're looking into now. There, there is an Oak Barrens biophysical setting and an, oak, an associated model and description that has much more open than the Nowacki model that I showed. So I believe that that would better match the area you're talking about. Um, so what I'm, I'm noting to myself is to look back at, at some of the Curtis 
papers and make sure they were cited in the Oak Barron biophysical setting. And I'll, I'll look into that. So if, Jonathan, if we can connect later, that I would appreciate that. But my first thought is it's probably a different biophysical setting altogether. And, and also, um, Jonathan brings up a great point about northern Minnesota, which is probably very accurate for your part of the world as well. Um, we, we have a northern pine oak model that is in the northeast, in the North Atlantic, and also in northern Minnesota. And at the time we did the modeling, we were basing it on a lot of work that was launched from Bud Heinzelman. And if you've looked in the Great Lakes, you know Bud Heinzelman. And you guys probably have analogs to this. Now um, there's some great work coming out of the Wisconsin DNR, great work coming out of um, University of Wisconsin, multiple campuses that are saying, man, you need to refine those northern pine oak models. We think there were probably, there was probably more surface fire, blah, blah, blah. So, Jonathan, I think we have a, a good start on those models for northern Minnesota, but we, we also know there's some new information and probably information I didn't capture the first time around. So. Um, I would I would love to to get your feedback on those models and if nothing else we'll we'll have your questions from the chat saved so I'm going to look into that um, okay how does landfire differ from the recently released NatureServe National Vegetation Classification System okay this may be the hardest question of all um, and I can't give you a great answer honestly um, landfire Existing vegetation type most closely links up to nature serve ecological systems. Also, Landfire has a partnership to better incorporate the National Vegetation Classification System <laughs> into its um, data sets moving forward. So we're hoping to merge those. Um, I, I honestly get pretty confused with the old classification system. And what I'll encourage you to do is um, Go, you, go for others, uh, Jonathan, it looks like you have a great grasp on this um, if you're asking this question, but ESA.org, the Ecological Society of America, has just released an announcement about this new um, national vegetation classification system. So you can drill into that. Then um, Jim Smith, who's on this call, um, can also provide more information about this. It's, it's pretty confusing, honestly, and I, I wish I had a, a, a better answer for you, but let me summarize what I just said and say, um, we can get you more information. It's a great question, and if you're doing any crosswalking um, or looking across, trying to compare a land fire to other data sets, um, give us a buzz and we can get you more information about that. Okay, thank you, Dr. Patterson, for um, filling in some gaps on my previous question regarding historic versus prehistoric. And um, I, I think that makes sense. So that's, that's great feedback in the chat box there. All right, do we have other questions? Feel free to type them on into the chat box. While you're typing, um, just for the purposes of the recording, I'll read aloud Dr. Patterson's uh, response. He says, in my mind, prehistoric in southern New England is prior to 400 years. Historic is 100 to 400 years ago. Current is past 100 years or so. All right. Any other thoughts, questions for Randy? We'll give, give you another moment or so, but we're just coming up almost on 1 o'clock sharp. Well, if you have more questions, um, contact us, as you see on the page there. I, I really, really, really appreciate um, you joining in today. I know your time is really valuable, and I hope that the presentation was at least provocative and somehow um, useful for you. Um, let me know if, if you have any questions about the BPS review, about the models, about using the data sets. Um, yeah, and I'll look forward to hearing from you in the future. Great, thank you. Thank you very much to Randy and to Jeannie for providing that excellent presentation and background on land fire and the biophysical setting. Um, thanks everybody very much for joining us and we hope to catch you at a future NAFTA event.
Um, thanks again, Randy and Jean. This was an awesome webinar. I really appreciate your time. More than welcome. All right. Thank you, everyone. Have a great afternoon.